happy Mother's Day. I'm so thankful for um, the mom. I think we got a little sound. I don't know where it's coming from, but I'm so thankful for, um, for the mom that God has given me, a, a godly mom, a, a faithful mom, a given mom, a mom who's um, willing to sacrifice anything and everything for me. And I'm sure that there are many, many, many more moms here today and those of you watching. And um, we want to honor you today and we uh, thank you. We would not be uh, here without you. And um, your influence is, uh, the influence that you've had on us is profound. Uh, I want to bring a message to you today entitled, Without a Doubt, Without a Doubt. Now I want to ask you a question as we get into it. Have you ever have you ever been so full of faith, so full of faith in your life, but yet there's, there's a little area of your life where there are some doubts? There's a little bit, a little, some areas where you're like, um, I'm not really so sure about, you know, like I have a lot of faith in all of these areas, but when it comes to, and then you fill in the blank, when it comes to this Man, I, this, this, this one right here, this little area of life I, I struggle with. Um, has there ever been a, a time or a season in your life where you felt like you were so close to God? Like He was so real to you. He was so personal. He was um, like you could feel His presence. You know, you could feel his, his goodness. But then all of a sudden, something happened. Something changed. And you found yourself doubting. You found yourself asking questions. You found yourself like, I'm not really sure how close he is anymore. I'm not really sure. Like, you know, I'm praying and I'm trying to hang in there. But I don't know. Like, I, he's not answering my prayers. You know, if God could just ghost you. Like, I feel like he's ghosting me. I feel like I, I don't know where he's at. And you were, you're coming from a place where you were full of faith. And all of a sudden, something changes. And you're asking questions. And before you know it, you, uh, you're starting to worry, you're starting to ask questions, you begin to, you know, have a little bit of fear, maybe a, a little bit of anxiety, and before you know it, you doubt. Have you ever ask yourself, why is it that we, why do we doubt God? Have you ever ask yourself that question? Why is it that we Doubt God. I, I think that it's usually one of one of three things. And um, if you want to write these down, you can. One is questions we can't answer. Questions that we just simply don't have an answer for. Man, why did my dad have to get cancer? I don't understand. Man, why did I lose a child? Why can't we have children? I don't get it. I don't understand. My mind just, you know, it just, it just, you know, I can't wrap my mind around to it. Why did he cheat on me? Why did she cheat? It just baffles me. Questions we can't answer. Usually, we will doubt God when we have questions that we, we just, they're bigger than us. Two, situations that seem unfair. Situations that seem unfair. Lord, I have worked so hard. I have killed myself for this job. And they gave the promotion to them. They gave the promotion to her. They gave the promotion to him and let me go. It just doesn't seem fair, God. Why would you allow something like this to happen? Lord, why is my mom not like most moms? And maybe mothers say, for you, it's a difficult day. You know, why is my dad not like most that you know why how come like he never said i love you and it hurts and i don't get it and it just doesn't seem unfair he never hugged me or she never hugged me situations that seem unfair lord you answer their prayer and i've been begging you for years and you just it just does not seem fair and number three hurt that we cannot resolve you ask why do we doubt why do we ask like, why do we doubt God's goodness in our lives? Well, often one of the reasons is because there is hurt um, that we cannot resolve. It, it's, it, I, I call it baggage from the past. 
baggage from the past. Have you ever been just having a, a beautiful day and all of a sudden you stepped on, uh, on gum? Oh, we're getting a little bit of feedback, guys. I don't know where that's coming from. Maybe one of the mics. <clears throat> Have you ever just, I'll step away a little bit. Uh, have you ever been just been walking and just having a wonderful day and it's sunny out and weather's beautiful and then you stepped on gum and it's like maybe a, a hot summer day and it's one of those like bubble gums. It's like, like you try to, like you try to, and the thing like stretches, right? And then you take it and it's still half of it on your shoe and the other half is on your fingers and you try to go and it's on this hand and now it's on this hand and your shoe and I'm like, I don't know, has that ever that's how hurt from the past that hasn't been resolved, that's how it is. Better, better illustration, in case you didn't like that. Have you ever just stepped on um, doggy poop? <laughs> Have you ever done that? I think you like that one better. And it just, it just stinks, and you're like... <sighs> I know it's not me. I, you know, I'm good. I'm not, I have not had an accident, you know? And, you just, and it just follows you, right? You get in the car, and it's like, man, that's just, that's like messed up. And you, you get to the groceries, and it's like, I hope nobody's around me, you know? And you can't wait to get home to hose it off, right? Hurt from the past, when it hasn't been resolved, is like a piece of bubble gum. It sticks. It's like, stepping on it it stings and usually one of those three things you want to know people like when i come across someone that's they've been faithful they've been full of faith you know they love the lord but they come through something and now they're all of a sudden they're doubting god you know why one of the reasons is they have, a, they have questions that they just simply can't answer. They, they have, you know, they've gone through a situation that it just seems unfair to them. They have hurt from the past that hasn't been resolved. And, and, and so for some of you, you may be here and, and you may be asking a question that's not uncommon. Why would a loving God allow something so bad to happen to me? Right? I was only a child. I was, and you, you fill in the blank, right? Why would, if God really, if he was alive and he, if he is who Pastor Alex says he is, then why, why would he, a good God, a loving God, allow this horrible thing to happen to me? And, and, and you feel rejected. You feel rejected by a spouse. You, maybe you feel, you feel, you feel abandoned by a, a parent, Maybe you're here and you feel like your friends, somehow they've, they, they've forgotten about you. Your employer has forsaken you. They, like, they moved on. This new project came, came along and everybody got on board and it just seemed like they just, you know, they just kept you to the side. And you're like, why, Lord? And here's the thing that I want you to know. As you, as you look at the verses that we're going to be looking at today, here's the thing that you've got to know, okay? You've got to put this in this frame for you to understand what we're talking about. When Jesus was on the cross, he felt some of those same feelings. He had some of those doubts. My God, my God, why have you, do you know the verse? You know when he's on the cross? My God, my God, finish it for me. Why have you forsaken me? So you're not the only one who doubts God. I doubt God on a regular basis. If I can be... Um, brave enough to share with you and it, you know from up here it looks like you're full of faith but if you know me if you know the real Alex this is this is a version of me right but if you get to know me my most innermost insecurities my the, the things that I wrestle with you would know that th this is a guy that has lots of doubts on a regular basis and what you want, what I want to share with you today comes from the heart, but here, here it is. We are going to look at God's word, and we're going we're gonna to learn firsthand from someone, Jesus, who's going to teach us how to live without a doubt. That's the title of the message, how to live without a doubt. So we're in Matthew 28, verse 16. If you, if you want to follow along, Matthew 28, verse 16, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says this. It says, then the 11 disciples left for Galilee. Not the 12 disciples, the 11 disciples left for, they left for, for Galilee, going to the mountain, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Okay, so 11 disciples left Galilee, 
they're going, they're going to hike up a mountain where Jesus told them to go, all right? Let me give you a little bit of the context so you understand where, where we're coming from. Um, this event, okay, what's going on here, it happened after the cross, okay? So Jesus had died, and he, he had come back from the dead, okay? And this is one of 13 times after Jesus was resurrected, he appeared uh, at least that's recorded in scripture 13 different times this is one of those occasions okay so if you remember the stories he showed up to the two ladies at the tomb right um he um he showed up to those guys that were on the road to Emmaus remember that story he um there was a, a, a gathering a group of about 500 people he showed up there so there was more than one okay but this is one of 13 okay one time he showed up to um uh, their disi his disciples were having a meal he just walked right in he showed up there Another time, he took his disciples fishing. So all of this is after his resurrection, okay? In this case, Matthew 28, he told 11 of his disciples to go up a mountain, and he said, I'm going to meet you there. Now, let's, let's look in verse 17, verse 17, okay? Here's a key verse for, for us today. It says, when they saw him, so they climbed the mountain, and it says, when they saw Jesus... They, help me out, church, they, what's that, that word, rather, they what? They worshiped him. And they saw him, imagine that, right? They see him after he had died, right? They saw the crucifixion, they saw how he was punished, and now he says, hey, meet me at the, and they, they go up there, and they, when they saw him, they worshiped him, rightfully so. But some of them, what? Doubt it. Some of it. Some of them doubt it. Right, let's begin with the, let's open up with a word of prayer as we get into it. God, Father, I just, um, I thank you that um, you allow us to be human. And God, I pray that um, you would infiltrate our minds and hearts with your teaching today. I, I hope that we would see how you deal with doubters. I hope that you would, you would, that we would see firsthand today how you deal with people who worry, who people who don't trust you with People who uh, question you and your existence and why you allow things to happen. And so, God, I ask for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes that you would speak to us, God. Remove all distractions, if you would, from this place. Allow us to focus on you. And, God, I believe that this is a message, and not, not just for moms, but it's for dads, it's for single people, it's for all of us. And so, God, I pray that you would do what I can do. And pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just because you have questions does not make you bad. Questions make you human, okay? Let me read the verse again. It says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubt it. Some of them doubt it. Sometimes this is a challenge, challenge in churches because we don't allow people to be themselves in church, okay? We, we have a tendency to, to, um, to not allow people uh, to fully express themselves and to have the freedom to ask some of the, the difficult questions that they have. And we make people feel judged at times. Sometimes we make them feel inferior. Like, I don't, I don't want to. And it's not said out loud, per se. But, you know, I've been doing this for a while. And, and I know that sometimes religious people, we have a tendency to, with our attitude or, um, you know, our lack of things that we say or the things that we do say, it's just like, if you ask this question, that's a big no-no. You can't go down that line of thoughts because, you know, somehow the church is going to put a little bit of shame on you. That somehow the church is going to make you feel uncomfortable. When I think it should be the opposite. If I had one wish, I would say, God, may this place, may Life Point be a place where, where people feel safe enough to ask any questions they want to ask, regardless of their background, regardless of what they believe, regardless of where they're coming from, regardless of, you know, whether they're in the right or they're in the wrong. I want us to be a place where when we come to life groups, like we, we can ask and not hide some of the difficult questions that many of us hide, that many of us have, but we hide in secret. Uh, I love this, this quote by Oswald Chambers. He said, doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be a sign that he is thinking and I think that there's so much tr truth to that. Doubt is not always a sign that you're wrong. It may be that you're just thinking. So here's what I want to do. I want to make two observations. 
about your doubts, okay? And then we're out, okay? Two observations about your doubts, and then we will, we will be done. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Doubts handled properly can be a catalyst to stronger faith. Your doubts, when you handle them properly, they can actually set you up for success. They can be a catalyst, like a trampoline, right? It, they, can, they can set you, they can, um, they can launch you into a good place, good success, spiritual success. Um, so if you're a parent, okay, and you have raised your children in church, okay, do not be surprised if at some point your kids begin to wrestle with doubt okay so i'm talking to parents if you have kids and they they, they, you brought them to church all of their life they've grown up in church three of them they've been in church since the day they were born they were in church before they were born okay it is okay do not panic when when they grow up and probably sometime around their teenage years it's okay if they begin to wrestle with Their faith, which is really not yet their faith yet. It's actually been your faith all along. And so as parents, and just kind of a little bit of a side note, because this is something that I I just learned recently, and I'm learning, um, and so I hope that it adds value to you. But as parents, you cannot, there's a point when your, your, your kids, when they're babies and they're toddlers, you know, you know, five, six, seven, eight, like you can tell them what to do, but there is a point where it transitions and you can't, it's not as easy to tell them what to do. Does, that, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. Give me a, like, an, a, like a strong amen if you know what I'm talking about when you're dealing with teenagers. It's not so easy anymore, right? Parents, are you in the room? Let me talk to this side of the room. Like, do you get what I'm saying? When your teenager just doesn't want to follow, you know, some of the rules that you place in, that you put in place, do you, can you relate? Give me a like thumbs up, an amen, a woo hoo yeah, I'm here, pastor. Okay, thank you, I'm not the only one. Whew. For a minute there, I was like, am I the only one there? But you're, there is a point where all, all you can do is build their conscience. Their conscience, our conscience is like the courtroom. It's, it's where we make, it's a, like the decisions that we make in life a lot of times happen in the courtroom of our minds. And so you as a parent, you may not be able to dictate every area of their life, but what you can do is you can train them in the ways of the Lord. and You can teach them right from wrong. And at some point, it'll be up to them. It'll be up to them whether they choose. You can't choose for them always. And so hopefully that sets you free as a parent. But here's what I I do think that it's important to mention. When they begin to wrestle with those doubts, you know, you have to understand it's not their faith just yet. It's, It's your faith, and they're trying to ask the questions. But when it comes to that place, don't panic. The worst thing that you can do is like, oh, no, you believe something that I've never taught you. And when you do that, you disengage. The best thing you can do is to allow them to process some of the questions that they have so your faith can actually become their faith. Here's what I hope. I hope that you will discover that the strongest faith is not a faith that never doubts. The strongest faith is a faith that grows past those doubts. Does that make sense? And so the same way it is for your kids. Let me give you a couple of examples as we study this. The first one is Thomas in the New Testament. Okay, so in John 20, 24, and we're going to be there here in a minute. Uh, Thomas is one of Jesus' disciples, and um, when Jesus comes back from the dead, he shows up before some of his disciples, but that initial meeting, Thomas was not there. Okay? And so... The rest of the disciples, when they saw Thomas after they had seen Jesus, they were like blown. Of course, you know, you know, you see Jesus dying, and then all of a sudden you see him alive. And you know, like any of us, they were they were shocked. And they looked at Thomas and they said, "Man, you missed it. You went in there. Like, where were you? We've seen the Lord. We heard him. We talked to him. We engaged in conversation with him. And and so, you know, there. I think that there. You know." 
my Bible doesn't say this, but my personal opinion, I think Thomas was a little bit jealous. And they're going on and on, you know, and they're like, he was dead. We saw him suffer. We saw him died. And now, like, he's alive. We talked to him. We asked him questions. He talked to us back. Like, we could, we could see him. And, 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 there, and Thomas, remember that, that what he said? He's like, I won't believe it until I see him. I won't believe what you're telling me until I put my fingers in his hands where they pierced his hands and I, and I look at his side, his pierced side. That, that was the thing. And now, throughout history, poor Thomas, he's, he's gotten a bad rap, right? Bad, like, like you, know, you know what Thomas is called, right? What do we call poor Thomas? Tell me, you said it. Doubting Thomas. Poor guy, right? Like, throughout history, this guy has been doubt in Thomas you know that's a, that's the thing but I want you to stop and think for a moment why did the rest of the disciples believe because they saw him they talked to him right Thomas he just wanted to see him he just wanted to ask him some questions he wanted to engage with him. And I, and I really think that there is a lot of Thomases here and today. I think there's a lot of Thomas in you and me and in our kids. We just want to know for ourselves. We don't want somebody telling us. You can tell me about your faith or I can have my own faith. And there's a big difference. And so Thomas is not, you know, I mean, bad rep all throughout history. To doubting Thomas, but the guy was not as bad as he, we may think he is. He was a lot more like you and I he had been through some stuff yeah I'm sure he faced some disappointments he encountered some heartbreaks he just had some questions just because you ask questions doesn't make you bad it just makes you human here's another time where John 14 um, Jesus is gathered with his disciples and this time Thomas was in this in this in this meeting okay it was before the resurrection and Jesus kind of stops what they're doing and they say, hey guys, I, I just need to tell you something. Just want to give you a heads up. I want to blindside you. Um, he says, uh, I, um, I'm going to be gone for a while. I'm going to go away. He, says, he tells his disciples. And I don't know if you remember the story, but he's like, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be gone for a while. I'm going to prepare a better place. The King James says, you know, that he's going to prepare, like, in my, my father's house, there are many mansions, right? Like, I'm going to prepare a place for you. It's going to be okay. Nothing, no need to worry about. Just want to give you a heads up. I'm going to be gone for a while. What did Thomas do in that moment? It's like, what do you mean you're going to be gone? What are you talking about? We need more detail. Where are you going? How are we going to follow you? We want to go where you're going. Like, we need to know so that we can, so that we can be proper followers of Jesus, Right? Thomas just wanted to know. He just had some sincere questions. And so when your kids are asking some of those questions, or maybe even it's you, when you ask those questions, maybe you're in your, your late teens, your early 20s, 30s, and you've been taught certain things from, from mom and dad all of your life, but now you've got questions. Here's what I'm encouraging you to do. Do not panic. Don't panic. If you find out that what your parents taught you, it's not exactly what the Bible says. Maybe it was something that was taught during that day and age, but things have changed nowadays. And when you look at Scripture, you're like, actually, you know, this right here, I don't quite agree. I know my parents were well intended, but, you know, what happens often in, a, in probably the last 10 years is that we question our faith, and if there is, at one point, if there is one little thing, that we find, oh my goodness, my parents interpreted this from Scripture the wrong way. Or my church taught me this. And then, then here's what we do. We throw away everything else. And we're like, I cannot be a Christian anymore. You know? Hey, we're human beings. Allow for some mistakes, right? And one of the things, uh, it, it, you know, while I'm at it, um, <laughs> you're supposed to test if what I'm saying is truthful or not right and so my point is questions are good don't panic 
Don't step away. This is a time for you. When you're doubting, this is a time for you to lean in. This is a time to process. This is a time to engage with people that you trust. This is a time to find someone that, that's been faithful for a while and say, hey, why do you think this happened? And just have, hey, can I, can I sit up? Can we do coffee sometime? I, w- I want to ask you some really challenging questions that I don't understand about, my rela- about God, my relationship with God, your relationship with God. I just want to ask some questions. And my encouragement to you is keep pressing into the things of God. Now, I want you to see as we can kind of wrap things up, I want you to watch how Jesus responds to Thomas. This is beautiful, okay? The way that Jesus responds to doubters. Because often he will respond to you in the same way. And I love, I love this, man. It can't get any better than this. So let's, we're in John 20, 25. It says this. So they told him, the disciples told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. I told you that little story earlier, right? I think they're bragging a little bit, okay? Like if you look at the, at the Greek, it's in the active uh, tense. Like it, it means that, like they're going on and on and on. We've seen him, we've seen him, you missed him. You know, like they're playing that game, all right? Personally, I think that they're, they're a little bit, they're just bragging just a tad too much, okay? So they told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But he, Thomas, replied, I won't believe it until, unless I, I see the nail wounds in his hands. I told you this. Put my, my fingers into them. Am I still on? Can you guys hear me? Did I? Hello, hello, hello? My, can you guys hear me? Okay. Something happened up here. Um, I won't believe it. I won't believe it until, unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them. Put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. All right. So that's what I told you. Now look, look at verse 20, uh, 26. Verse twenty six. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. Now help me out. How many days later? Eight days later. I love this because here's an individual who had doubts. Here's an individual who said, don't believe it. I have questions. I don't know if he has the power to come back from the dead. I just don't understand what's going on. And I'm not, unless I'm able to put my, my finger in his hand and I'm able to see his pierced sides, not going to believe any of you. The, here's a doubter. And only eight, day, eight days later, what's Thomas doing? He's re-engaging. And I believe that there are some people here today, there are some of you watching, you have been hurt. You may have been hurt by a church. You may have been hurt by a religious person. And listen, all I can do is applaud your faithfulness because you're here and you're engaging and you haven't given up faith. And just like Thomas, he shows up. It could have been so easy for him to disengage. And if you're bitter and if you're hurting, I want to talk to you from somebody who has been bitter, who has raised a fist to, whoa, guys, what's going on? Okay, you know, okay, is that me? Raise a fist, okay. (laughs) I won't do it, I promise. It was just an example. I've already asked for forgiveness, Lord. (laughs) <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, right? If, if you're bitter, listen, there's a place for you. Thomas doesn't give up. And I want you to see how Jesus deals with the doubter, okay? It, the end of verse 26, it says, The doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. The Bible says that after Jesus was resurrected, he could walk through walls. I don't know how to explain that, but that's what Scripture says. And so he shows up, and he says, peace be uh, with you, which is kind of like a greeting uh, with um, in, that, in that day and age. And Jesus, watch this, looks at Thomas and says... So he comes into this room that was locked. They were afraid of persecution. He steps right in the middle of them. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my my hand. Put your hand into the wound in my side. 
Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And Thomas shouts, I will say, verse 28, my Lord, my God. And it's, it's, he exclaims. So this is like he's, he screamed, like, I, like, oh, it's you. I cannot believe it, right? Imagine, like, it wasn't just like, oh, it's you. No, no, no. This was like, holy cow. Like, there's nothing that I've ever seen, no, nothing that I've ever experienced like this. What did Jesus do? How did Jesus respond to the doubter? Jesus came to him, and he gave him exactly what he needed. And I, I, I believe this. I don't, the Bible doesn't say, but I really believe. He had already met with the disciples. I think Jesus came back, and he met with them because Thomas was with them this time around. I think he came back for Thomas. And so if you're in a season of your life where you're bitter and you're doubting and you're, you don't trust the Lord and you don't know what's going on, I just want to let you know, Jesus is ready. He's not intimidated by your doubts, and he's going to give you exactly what you need. What I learned from this, I told you two observations. What I learned from this is that God is not distant in our doubts. God is not distant. So number one, doubts handled properly can be a catalyst to stronger faith. So keep pressing on, keep showing up. But number two, second observation about your doubts is God is not distant in your doubts. If, if you remember the story that we began with, where Jesus says, hey, go up to the mountain. I'm going to meet you there. Remember that story? They showed up. And I love the fact that Jesus was present before those who worshipped him and those who doubted him. He, with, he was within close proximity to both the group that had faith and the group that had lost faith. And the same way it is in your lives. Your doubts do not automatically disqualify your faith. You hear me? Your doubts do not automatically disqualify your faith. I would say it this way. Your greatest doubters often become your strongest believers. That's why when I see a teenager who's doubting, oh boy, I get excited. Inside of me, there's like a little bit of like, God's going to use them. There's so much, so much potential inside of them. Because think, think about it. Paul. Great example. Peter. Remember Peter? He's on the boat. There's a storm. They can't see worth it. There's fog all over. Jesus comes walking on water. They're like, is that a ghost? And, and Peter goes, if it's you, and Jesus is like, it's, don't worry, it's me. Don't, you know, I'm not a ghost. And he's like, if it's you, tell me to walk out. I want to walk on water like you. That's the boldness that Peter has. He steps out. And you know the story. He, be, he looks at the wind. He sees the, the water. He begins to sink. And he says, save me, Lord, save me. Let's put this, the, the verse on the screen. Is Jesus inti is intimidated by Peter's doubt? No. He grabs him and he pulls him up. Jesus immediately reaches out and grabs him. And Jesus says, why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? Now, what if this question is not an accusation? What if this question is more of an invitation for self-reflection, for, for growth. What if the interpretation of this verse is not, man, how stupid are you, Peter? You walked with Jesus for three and a half years. Come on, you think he's going to let you drown right now? What if the interpretation is not that, but what if it is, buddy, I'm here right next to you. Why do you, why do you doubt me? So I'll wrap it up with this. Hebrews 13, 5 says this. Keep your lives. I believe this will speak to some of you today. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So doubt is not the enemy of faith. Doubt is just an invitation to deeper faith. 
So with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm just curious, how many of you would say, how many of you would say, Pastor, I'm struggling right now with doubt? Yep. I see all the hands. This message is worth nothing if you don't do a little self-reflection. So let's just be honest. How many of you would say right now, Pastor, I'm, I'm struggling with doubt. Would you at least raise your hand just a little bit? Yeah. 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 He sees that. Even if you're not raising your hand, he sees that right now. Because he knows you. Let me pray for you. Father God, we come before you and we're so thankful that doubts handled properly can actually be a catalyst to our faith. So God, help us to keep showing up. Help us to keep pressing on. Help us to keep engaging with you as hard as it may be. God, thank you for the reminder that you're never distant. Despite our imperfections, God, despite our, our questions, the, despite a, the, the mess that we, sometimes we bring upon ourselves, the, despite the sin that we encounter and that we, that we have to deal with, God, thank you that we can come run into you. And thank you that you're not intimidated by my mess. And thank you that just like Peter, if I, at a moment's notice I say, save me, God, in that moment you reach out. And you don't judge me. You don't point fingers. You don't bring up the past. But you rescue me because that's the kind of God that you are. And so God, help us to live for you, to fix your eyes on you, and not disengage when we doubt you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.